Greetings, fourth graders. This is Mrs. Robinson, and I'm here today to share with you one of my favorite picture books to share with students this time of year. It is called Encounter by Jane Yolen. To get ready for our read aloud today, I'd like you to get your reading notebook out and get it set up just like this with six sticky notes and the title and the author across the top. Pause the video, and once your page is ready, you can go ahead and start. This is Encounter by Jane Yolen, illustrated by David Shannon. And we're gonna get started thinking about the story right away. So on your first sticky note, I would like you to think about this question. What do you think the word encounter means in relation to this story? As you're thinking about that, I'm actually gonna read the little description that's on the inside flap of the cover to get you thinking about what the word encounter means in relationship to this story. It says, it is said that in 1492, Christopher Columbus discovered a new world, yet what he really found was a people with an established culture and civilization of their own. This is the story of that first meeting, as seen through the eyes of a Taino boy, an encounter that changed the world forever. So take a moment and think about that question and get your thought jotted on your first sticky note. Pause the video. And when you're ready, press play. The moon was well overhead, and our great fire had burned low. A loud clap of thunder woke me from my dream. All dreams are not true dreams, my mother says. But in my dream that night, three great winged birds with voices like thunder rode wild waves in our bay. They were not like any birds I had ever seen, for sharp, white teeth filled their mouths. I left my hammock and walked to the beach. There were my dream birds again, only now they were real. Three great sailed canoes floating in the bay. I stared at them all through the night. When the sun rose, each great canoe gave birth to many little ones that swam awkwardly to our shore. I ran then and found our chief still sleeping in his hammock. Do not welcome them, I begged him. My dream is a warning. But it is our custom to welcome strangers, to give them the tobacco leaf, to feast them with the pepper pot, and to trade gifts. You are but a child, our chief said to me. All children have bad dreams. The baby canoes sped out many strange creatures, men but not men. We did not know them as human beings, for they hid their bodies in colors like parrots. Their feet were hidden also. And many of them had hair growing like bushes on their chins. Three of them knelt before their chief and pushed sticks into the sand. Then I was even more afraid. Let's stop here for a moment and take a close look at this illustration. How does the illustration on this page, in addition to the words, help us to understand what is happening in this moment. This is going to be your second sticky note. Pause the video here, or back up a little bit to take a close look at that illustration. And when you're ready, press play. Our young men left the shelter of the trees. I, who was not yet a man, followed, crying, do not welcome them, do not call them friends. No one listened to me, for I was but a child. Our chief said, we must see if they are true men. So I took one by the hand and pinched it. The hand felt like flesh and blood, but the skin was moon to my son. The stranger made a funny noise with his mouth, not like talking, but like he w the barking of a yellow dog. Our chief said to us, see how pale they are? No one can be that color who comes from the earth. Surely they come from the sky. Then he leaped before them and put his hands up, pointing to the sky, to show he understood how far they had flown. Perhaps they have tails, said my older brother. Perhaps they have no feet. Our young men smiled, but behind their hands, so the guests would not feel bad. Then they turned around to show that they had no tails. Our chief gave the strangers balls of cotton thread to bind them to us in friendship. 
He gave them spears that they might fish and not starve. He gave them gum rubber balls for sport. He gave them parrots too, which made our young men laugh behind their hands all over again, knowing it was our chief's little joke that the strangers looked like parrots. But the strangers behaved almost like human beings, for they laughed too and gave in return tiny smooth balls the color of sand and sea and sun strung upon a thread. And they gave hollow shells with tongues that sang chinga chunga, and they gave woven things that fit upon a man's head and could cover a boy's ears. For a while, I forgot my dream. For a while, I was not afraid. So we built a great feasting fire and readied the pepper pot and yams and cassava bread and fresh fish. For though the strangers were not quite human beings, we would still treat them as such. Our chief rolled tobacco leaves and showed them how to smoke, but they coughed and snorted and clearly did not know about these simple things. Let's stop here and think about our third sticky note. What do you think is the genre of this book? And what characteristics of that genre have you noticed in the book? Take a moment, jot down your thoughts, pause the video. When you're ready, press play. Then I leaned forward and stared into their chief's eyes. They were blue and gray like the shifting sea. Suddenly I remembered my dream and stared at each of the strangers in turn. Even those with dark human eyes looked away like dogs before they are driven from the fire. So I drew back from the feast, which is not what one should do, and I watched how the sky strangers touched our golden nose rings and our golden armbands, but not the flesh of our faces or arms. I watched their chief smile. It was a serpent's smile, no lips and all teeth. I jumped up crying, do not welcome them, but the welcome had already been given. I ran back under the trees, back to the place where my Zemus stood. I fed it little pieces of cassava and fish and yam from the feast, then I prayed. Let the pale strangers from the sky go away from us. My Zemus stared back at me with unblinking wood eyes. I gave it the smooth balls a stranger had dropped in my hand. Take these eyes and see into the hearts of the strangers from the sky. If it must be, let something happen to me to show our people what they should know. My Zemus was silent. It spoke only in dreams. Indeed, it had spoken to me already. When I returned to the feast, one of the strangers let me touch his sharp silver stick. To show I was not afraid, I grasped it firmly, as one would a spear. It bit my palm so hard the blood cried out, but still no one understood, no one heard. They did not hear because they did not want to listen. They desired all that the strangers had brought, the sharp silver spear, round pools to hold in the hand that gave a man back his face, darts that sprang from sticks with a sound like thunder, that could kill a parrot many paces away. We were given none of these, only singing shells and tiny balls on strings. We were patted upon the head as a child pats a yellow dog. We were smiled at with many white teeth, a serpent's smile. Our next question comes from this page. What do you think the narrator means when he says, they did not hear because they did not want to listen? Pause the video, jot down your thoughts, and when you're ready, press play. The next day, the strangers returned to their great canoes. They took five of our young men and many parrots with them. They took me. I knew then it was a sign from my Zemus, a sign for my people, so I was brave and did not cry out, but I was afraid. That night, while my people slept on shore, the great sailed canoes left our bay, going farther and farther than even our strongest men could go. Soon the beach and trees and everything I knew slipped away, until my world was only a thin, dark line stretched between sky and sea. What else was there to do? In the early morning, another land lay close enough to see. 
Silently, I let myself over the side of the great canoe. I fell down and down and down into the cold water. Then I swam to that strange shore. Many days I walked, following the sun. Many nights I swam, and many times the sky was full with the moon and stars. All along the way I told the people of how I had sailed in the great canoes. I told of the pale strangers from the sky. I said our blood would cry out in the sand. I spoke of my dream of the white teeth. But even those who saw the great canoes did not listen, for I was a child. So it was we lost our lands to the strangers from the sky. We gave our souls to their gods. We took their speech into our mouths, forgetting our own. Our sons and daughters became their sons and daughters, no longer true humans, no longer ours. That is why I, an old man now, dream no more dreams. That is why I sit here wrapped in a stranger's cloak, counting the stranger's bells on a string, telling my story. May it be a warning to all the children and all the people in every land. So as this story comes to an end, let's get our question on our fifth sticky note. Why do you think the author chose to tell this story from the boy's point of view? Pause the video, jot your thoughts, and when you're ready, press play. Author's note. When Christopher Columbus landed on San Salvador, his first landfall in the New World on October 12th, 1492, he claimed the beautiful little green island for his king and queen and country. Yet it was not an uninhabited island upon which he set the Spanish flag. The Taino lived there and called the place Guanahani after the island's many iguanas. The Taino were a gentle people who wore gold nose rings and gold armbands, sometimes painted their faces and bodies, and always greeted strangers with a feast. Columbus called the tribe's people Indians, mistaking the land for India. In his journal, he wrote that they were well made with fine shapes and faces, their hair short and coarse like that of a horse's tail, combed toward the forehead, except a small portion which they suffer to hang down behind. The Taino gave the sailors balls of cotton thread and fish darts and parrots in friendship. In turn, the sailors gave them Venetian glass beads, little brass bells, and red caps. They asked in sign where the natives' gold rings and armbands came from. It was the gold that interested them the most. Columbus carried away ten young Taino men and women, or six, according to different sources, from the various islands they visited, carting them back to Spain as slaves. Later, when the islands were colonized by the Spanish, their native religions, languages, and lifestyles were changed forever. Though there were originally some 300,000 native islanders, by 1548, a little more than 50 years later, less than 500 remained. Today, there are no full-blooded Taino. Since most stories about that first encounter are from Columbus's point of view, I thought it would interest readers to hear a Taino boy speak. We don't have an actual record of that, so I have recreated what he might have said, using historical records and the storyteller's imagination. Sticky note number six. What are your final thoughts and opinions about this book? Pause the video, jot down your thoughts, and when you're ready, press play. Thank you for listening and sharing your thoughts about Encounter by Jane Yolen and illustrated by David Shannon. Make sure you take a picture of your reading notebook page and submit it to your teacher so we can see all of your great thinking.